Gwynish le Corrige. It's Misha Paul Aquinigoyne. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Cunningham. I'm delighted to be with you here today. And I'd like you to welcome, in an appropriate way, my distinguished panelists. So I'm happy to welcome Chris Fabian, who's Principal Advisor in Innovation for the UNICEF Office of Innovation. <laughs> Sylvia Sferego, who's Director of the Frugal Innovation Hub at Santa Clara University. And last, but by no means least, your own Sonia Sachs, Director of the Health Sector's Center for Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start by introducing you to IEEE and the work of the Humanitarian Activities Committee. So IEEE is a global association of scientists, technologists, and engineers. We have over 417,000 members in 160 countries. The diversity and breadth and depth of our technological, scientific, and engineering expertise, I hope, is illustrated by the number of technical societies and councils that we have. And student membership is something extremely important to us. So we have 120,000 members. And I'm hoping that at the end of today, we will have more members. So how do we deliver value to humanity? We organize over 1,800 technical and scientific conferences a year. We publish over 4 million technical documents. We're responsible for over 200 top-tier cited periodicals. And we're actively involved in standards. The one of which you know best is Wi-Fi. In terms of social impact, we add value in four key areas. Uh, global public policy, sustainable development work by volunteers, continuing education and certification, and a critical area from my perspective for all of us today, ethics and technology. So the work of the Humanitarian Activities Committee, which reports to the IEEE Board of Directors, is to strengthen the capacity and impact of IEEE volunteers contributing in sustainable development activities around the world. And we do that in a number of ways. First of all, raise awareness. It's amazing the number of scientists, technologists, and engineers who don't realize the contribution that they can make to the wider society. By facilitating appropriate levels of education for people at different levels of experience. To provide funding for relevant educational and community building activities, as well as projects and events that involve IEEE. We support multi-stakeholder collaboration through IEEE site, our special interest group in humanitarian technology, and we are building strategic partnerships around the world to facilitate impact, because together we're stronger. So this just gives you a snapshot of the type of activity that HSC has supported just over the last two years. Site, I hope, is something that some of you will go online and join. It doesn't cost you anything, and you don't even have to be an IEEE member. So the Special Interest Group in Humanitarian Technology is designed specifically to, to facilitate collaboration between IEEE and non-IEEE members. And we currently have site groups in over 40 countries in the world, addressing a variety of different um, domains, including agriculture and nutrition, education, health, communication, and, of course, energy. IEEE volunteers are supporting the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals in a variety of different ways. And because we're such a large organization, the saying goes that sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And to address that potential gap, we're carrying out a comprehensive landscape analysis of activities in which IEEE volunteers are involved around the world. And while that work is not complete, I can share some initial results. And what's striking is the breadth and extent of areas in which IEEE volunteers are making a meaningful contribution to societal impact. And I think that reflects the breadth and depth of technological, scientific, and engineering capacity that's available. You can see, and it's probably no surprise, that there's a huge amount of effort going on in areas including education, energy, sustainability, inequality, work, and health but there are other areas. So my invitation to you today is that if you're not an IEEE member, why not consider joining us? And even if you don't want to become an IEEE member, why not consider collaborating with us? Perhaps we can work with you 
to make life better for all of us. So it's my pleasure to now hand over for each of my panelists to give you a short introduction to themselves from the role perspective, starting with Chris. Cool, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, actually, so we wanted, first of all, for you to introduce yourselves to us for a second. So can you raise your hand if you're in the tech space? Are you coming from technology? We all kind of come from technology today. So who's coming from academia? Okay, public sector, government. Everybody's too embarrassed to raise their hand there. Okay, that's fine. Um, my name's Chris. I work at UNICEF. I run a small team called UNICEF Ventures. We're going to all talk a lot about um, some of the projects that we find most exciting and the philosophies that we find underpin those. But I just wanted to give everybody a quick two-minute overview of what our team does at UNICEF. It's a, it's a bit of a unique group, and you can find out more about it by using the Google and typing in UNICEF Ventures, and you will see information. But I wanted to tell a story from about four years ago, which was during the Ebola crisis in Liberia, uh, when our team was there, when I was in Monrovia, in like about this time of year, but in 2014, um, we landed there. We had no information about where the disease was spreading. This was kind of at the peak, right after the peak of it. So it was, it was going down a little bit, but you couldn't, we couldn't tell that at that point. Um, and we were working in the UNICEF office, working with young people, trying to figure out where this disease was moving. And it was something we didn't even know a lot about as responders, as emergency responders. And our team was in Monrovia for about two months and then in Sierra Leone after and in Guinea. Um, and one of the things that we kept finding was that this lack of information for us, for the government, and for the people who were most affected was the single factor that impeded our ability to get in front of this horrible and scary epidemic. Um, and we worked with young people in Monrovia and built up a, a system off of an open source platform that we'd built before. So we have a system called Ureport. In UNICEF, your report has about 5 million active users, young people who send in text messages and get and receive information. And during the Ebola crisis in Liberia, we built up a version of that because it's open source. We could build it quickly. We could work with the Liberian telcos and with other UN agencies. And within about a month, we had 10,000 young people from throughout Liberia texting us and the government information about whether their school was closed, whether there were cases in their areas, or what they thought was most important. And that type of system, that type of real-time information, gave us a fundamentally different way to approach a problem uh, that's increasingly present, right? Pandemics are something that's now here in the world at a speed, size, and velocity that we couldn't have imagined 50 years ago, um, as is climate change, as is job loss, as is blah, blah, blah. It's a dark, it's a dark world we're living in. Um, but the idea of real-time information and the idea of having systems that can provide us with that type of real-time information is central to the work that we do in our team. So I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later in, uh, in the discussion today, but very excited to be here and to share the stage with these other uh, distinguished guests. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Are there slides there? Or you can just stand from there. Sylvia. Oh, yeah, the slides are here. Yeah, please. And the clicker is on, okay. on the desktop. Thank you. So, or not. Okay. Hello, I'm Silvia Figueira. I'm, I work at Santa Clara University, which is a small university in Silicon Valley in California. And we, I'm the director of a frugal innovation hub, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and what Santa Clara engineering students do. So we're part of a school of engineering, and we have a long tradition of working on humanitarian projects. So the students in Santa Clara, we have this idea of engineering with a mission. So we attract students that are interested in doing, you know, something good somewhere. So with that in, in mind, my job is basically to connect them to the need. So we have lots of partners around the world and locally actually in, in California as well. And I form groups with you know, an advisor, a faculty advisor to, to do a project. And so I'm just gonna give you some of the, an idea of the projects we have just real quickly to, you know, to give an idea of the, how broad this can actually get and how connected we are with the SDGs. So, some years ago, some, a couple of students went to Benning and deployed uh, a solar microgrid. And, and okay, so people do that all the time. So what's new about that is that there was somebody in there, in the field, in the community that actually took over and created a business. So now there is a business that provides you know, power to the community and you know, they pay a little bit uh, as they can. And now you know, the community actually has power because of that. So, this is basically you know, the kinds of projects they do, always connected with somebody in the field. Another one is a, uh, a refrigerator. So again, an organization contacted us saying, 
we have a problem. You know, people don't have a lot to eat and they throw, a, throw away food because they don't have a fridge. We need a low cost, low power fridge that people can actually afford. So this is another project in mechanical engineering where the students actually came up with a, a pilot for that. And it's very low cost, it's very low power, and it can work when it's really hot outside. Another example is a, a library system. So there is an organization called FAVL. They created several libraries in Burkina Faso, in Uganda, and Ghana, for, in, in rural communities. But they didn't have a library system. Those are expensive. And when, again, a team of the students actually worked out on creating one by just using a phone and the, a cloud, so that the libraries didn't have to invest in any equipment or scanners or anything like that. The mobile device can actually you know, help out in lots of different things like that, and this is one example. Another one is Wakabi. Again, a group of students came up with you know, this idea of developing an Uber-style kind of system for rural Uganda where people don't have access to data or Wi-Fi sometimes or GPS for that matter. So basically the whole system is SMS based and we donated the code and helped to create a social enterprise called Wakab. You can Google Wakab, they are there, they are operating with a code that we donated and got basically adapted by local developers. And just to, you know, to finalize here, considering that this is like a combination of SDGs actually, last year two students went to Uganda and deployed an aquaponic system. So again, there was a an organization there in the field that wanted to help some women, and the whole idea was to create you know, this system on campus in California, and then go to Uganda where they recreated with the local women so that they would learn how to do it and how to teach other women. So, and then the idea is to empower them, and this is already happening, so the women learn how to do that, and they are teaching you know, other women in the same community and in another community. So just, this is just to give you an idea, we have lots of projects like that, and if you actually have an organization and need the project, need the engineers to work on some kind of technology or innovation, you, know, you can always talk to me after the conference. Thank you. Thanks. Tanya. If you don't mind, I'll stay put because I'm comfy cozy. Um, I'm Sonia ehrlich -Sachs. I'm a pediatrician, endocrinologist, um, and a public health specialist. I work here at the Earth Institute at the Center for Sustainable Development, where I'm in charge of health systems for low-income setting. Um, I was very uh, attracted by the idea of the Earth Institute um, when we first came here in 2002. Um, and, uh, the main reason I liked it is I think what fuels most of us now, which is that um, there are serious problems in the world and it's dealt with usually by policymakers and the policymakers are not usually the ones that are the most well-informed, evidence, uh, science-based people. And then you have academia, wonderful universities like this one and others um, that have departmentfuls of scientists um, um, steeply, uh, deeply steeped in knowledge and facts and um, findings and results, but they have no way of influencing the policy. And so um, one of the reasons uh, my husband uh, and I came here is because of the opportunity to have the epistemic community, the university full of, chuck full of uh, scientists um, and the policies such as at the U policymakers like at the UN to work together on solving real world problems. What it does for the policymakers is it avails themselves the university um, uh, knowledge base. What it does for academia, I think, is also very interesting because it focuses the mind on what I think is pretty important, which is to solve the most um, painful <laughs> or, or the most challenging problems. So the Earth Institute here focused mainly on extreme poverty um, and climate change um, and social inequity and, and some other topics. Um, and what I liked, what it, what it does for the academia, academia, academia is uh, that it focuses on some actionable problem and that it requires an interdisciplinary approach. So for instance, <coughs> I am just a garden variety pediatrician, endocrinologist, but working in um, sub-Saharan Africa, if my goal was to improve child survival and um, child well-being, I better work with and try to understand um, uh, something about agriculture, tropical agriculture, something about infrastructure, um, um, schools, because uh, to have a healthy child at the end of the day requires all of these things. You need transportation, ambulance, clinics, schools, 
um, food systems, a social security system, caregivers, etc. So it forced us at the Earth Institute to work together if, uh, to, to work towards um, common goals. Um, we took on in the beginning the Millennium Development Goals, um, as you all know, which were the goals uh, promulgated by the, all the countries um, convened at the UN, and it focused on low-income setting as opposed to the SDG goals, which are now broader, uh, both in scope, in that it involves both poor, middle-income, and rich, and also in subject. It's not really just to close the economic gap, but also to the SDGs also focus on social equity, as you all know, and climate change, which is what we've been all talking about for days and years. Um, the specific project that I was involved in was something that we started in 2004 called Millennium Villages Project, which was a project uh, to see if the Millennium Development Goals can, in fact, be reached by a 10-year mile, mile uh, stone, which was 2015, in very rural very poor and rural um, areas of 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we addressed all of the underpinnings of poverty. So we addressed food production, health, access to health, access to education, infrastructure and business development in really the poorest, remotest areas of 10 uh, Sub-Saharan countries. And what my particular focus was not only just to bring in the interventions like the bed nets or make sure that children get immunized, but my focus was on systems building. Can you have a low cost but high impact health system that keeps mothers alive and children under five from dying under the age of five? Can you have a system that delivers the health care in these very low income setting? Um, and then the last uh, part of our effort um, is scale up what I call scale apology. Okay, so these pilots show that there are certain things that these systems can be made to work, but now how do you scale it up? And that's what I'm working on with others, of course, um, in in many instances, um, in the, basically the idea of universal health coverage. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, in terms of my own background, I'm director of the IST Africa Institute. I'm also a visiting fellow at Wrexham and Glenmurray University in Wales and a visiting professor at IUM in Namibia. So the ICT Africa Institute is a strategic partnership with ministries of innovation, science, and technology, currently in 18 African member states. It's supported by the African Union, the European Commission was founded in 2002, and it's open to all African member states. And I'll talk about some of the implementation work that we've been involved in as we continue this dialogue. So, Maybe the easiest place to start, since we're clearly looking at something that's very complex. We have a panel with very complementary expertise and I think some interesting insights to share in terms of how they go about these issues. So maybe we could start um, with Sylvia. Maybe you could do a deep dive into one specific project and maybe provide a little bit more insight in terms of how technology was leveraged to help achieve um, the SDGs. Okay, uh, I think I'd like to talk about the last one because it just happened. And so the idea was that we had this organization, we always work with another organization, so we believe in this idea of helping the helper. So we, we met these women that were helping these women in Uganda. So that's the last project I referred to. And then she, this person here, she's located here in the US, and she told us, you know, I really want to help these women. I, know, I think, they, you know, we can empower them to create their own business, to basically have their own system and basically, you know, plant and, and fish at the same time. So connect them with, you know, the students and a professor that, that's her specialty. And they work it in a whole system to basically build this aquaponic system. And, you know, the complicated part is, first of all, they're in California and, you know, they are going to have to build this in Uganda. So they had to do a huge research, understand the local resources that there were, were going to be available when they actually went to, to Uganda. So these are you know, part of the complications. You have to really understand you know, the setting and, and the local resources that you're going to have and, and the capacity that you know, the people are going to have there to do these things. So they worked you know, for months on the system, communicating all the time to understand better so that they went there. They were able to actually buy the things that were 
available and build with the women and so that they would learn the process and be able to replicate and teach other people. So it wasn't just build and donate. The whole idea was to build so that they could actually teach and teach how to how to replicate. So this is you know, one of the last projects we did that got deployed that we're really proud of. But yeah, so there's some of the difficulties are understanding the local resources and understanding you know, how, what the capacity is and, and what you're gonna be, have when you actually go there and, and deploy the whole system. So I suppose the key thing is not to make any assumptions in terms of you having a good idea. It no needs to be co-designed and needs to be locally owned. That's right. Sonia, maybe you could talk a little about how you're leveraging technology in Ghana. So, um, in the um, context of building health systems in very low income setting, basically in places where there's hardly roads, electricity, water, um, we have learned that you can actually have a pretty decent health system for what now would be about $80 per person per year, but we did it um, for $40 per person per year, working, of course, uh, only with local people, community, district, regional, and national, um, no expats. Um, and the biggest, uh, most interesting part for me was that the health system, if you want to really have a system that is self-sustaining and um, that can detect its own gaps and, and correct them, requires real-time data. So in our health systems, we worked with a clinic for 5,000 people, uh, the definition of a clinic has to be that it has to be open 24-7, it has to have a midwife and be able to do regular delivery, um, and that there is transportation, emergency streets, transportation to a, a hospital. The critical part was to have professionalized community health workers. Um, these community health workers were people living in their village um, in charge of about 100 households and being accountable uh, and responsible for what happens to these 100 households, focusing, of course, on maternal child health because uh, that was the biggest disease and death burden in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and countries like uh, Nigeria, um, Malawi, et cetera. Um, we found that we first um, used, uh, made sure that each community health worker is, first of all, paid so that they can be held accountable rather than be a volunteer, as has been traditionally done up till now. Paid and empowered by a cell phone. Uh, first, we used a regular um, phone because we started in 2005, uh, but then in 2009, we switched to a smartphone, which at the time was expensive, but then the price went down. And so um, since 2009, we've actually had all of our community health workers in 10 countries each site is about 35,000 people, have smartphones, and it's made all the difference. <laughs> uh, we've learned, of course, from specialists, uh, like my two uh, co-panelists. Um, these smartphones, um, very easily, uh, the very easily trained on for just second, secondary school graduates, and they provided both decision uh, support, in other words, if you're at a household, um, you, you can, uh, and there's a pregnant woman and a two-year-old, you can look what you're supposed to do to the pregnant woman, what you're supposed to tell her what to do, um, what interventions, et cetera, uh, or a two-year-old, check on the immunizations. Um, so it helps the community health worker, and at the same time, it gives the manager an incredible amount of uh, rich information. Uh, the cell phone, of course, immediately gives you geo-reference, um, and uh, by just typing that you saw the two-year-old um, and gave oral rehydration solution or that you told a pregnant woman uh, that she needs to go to clinic for her um, malaria prophylaxis, whatever, uh, the manager has a rich amount of information about uh, where, how many, CHW, uh, how many households at the CHWC, what kind of work did he or she do, and it really gives um, a very relatively accurate um, uh, management kind of information. And then at the same time, of course, it gives you um, continuous count of the disease burden because the person, if the community health worker goes to the household and learns that the child died, um, you know, they can, of course, uh, immediately put in the information. And so you really get a very accurate real-time uh, disease burden and death burden data. And so you can, number one, um, notice when the, you know, when the, let's say, the diarrhea, numbers of diarrhea, incidence of diarrhea goes up. You don't find that out a year later um, by some DHS surveys, but you find it out day by day that all of a sudden, instead of one case of diarrhea, all of a sudden the CHWs are reporting five, seven, 
eight cases of diarrhea per week, you know, what's going on? We should check the water source, et cetera. So it, it, gives, um, it gives you real time information about, that you can act on, either act on the management, improve the training, or fire the community health worker, and it gives you data um, about the disease burden, um, especially if, if there is a, uh, an epidemic, um, such as Chris referred to, uh, Ebola. Again, you don't find that out you know, a year later when there are dead bodies piled up by the clinic. You find it out by day-to-day um, -day information. So community health workers responsible for 100 households properly paid, properly managed, and empowered by a cell phone with an application. In our case, we use Dimagi's application called ComCare, is hugely beneficial. Thanks, Sonia. Thank you. Chris, you're somewhat looking at this from a different perspective, more of a macro perspective. So would you talk us through that and also talk about why you think your model and particularly your emphasis on open source technology is so critical? Sure. So. Uh, maybe I can go back to the same story, this, this idea, and I think we've all touched on it, of being able to get real-time information in ways that we might not expect. And, uh, you know, a Minister of Health might not have expected 10, 15 years ago to be able to get real-time data from not only doctors and health workers, but also from patients, and that's a possibility now. Um, but I think that I would add, in addition to the academic and the political, maybe one more dimension to this, which is the financial. Um, and I like finance. I don't like the crude, this caustic capitalism that we're all locked into today. I think that's a little bit off as a model, and we can see that tearing at the world around us. But, but finance in general is a pretty reasonable thing, and it's countable, and it has numbers, and it, it works, sort of. Um, but I think that the, this dimension of finance is very important in the development of these types of solutions. The, and, and by finance, I mean finding businesses that work supporting them and helping local entrepreneurs build these types of solutions because they're always better when they're built locally than when somebody comes up with them in New York. Our team has like a 98%, 99% failure rate for building anything in New York for the rest of the world, so, which is fine. We just stopped doing that a while ago. Um, and platforms like Rapid Pro, the platform that powers U-Report, the system that lets young people engage us and governments in real-time decision-making. That platform was built locally by engineers in Uganda, first in Ethiopia, then in Uganda, and in Malawi. Uh, and eventually we saw a bunch of these companies. At the time that John was starting Damagi, uh, John Jackson, at, at about that time we saw a bunch of companies all working in various countries, mostly in Sub-Saharan, mostly in East, in East Africa, on this same idea of like real-time information. And we thought, well, here's a premonition. Maybe if all of our stuff breaks all the time in New York, why don't we invest in these companies who are building this stuff locally? And let's invest in open source versions of this software. If we, if we invest in a proprietary version, we spend a bunch of UNICEF's money, we get locked into one solution, maybe it works really well in that context, but we know it, it won't work in the next country over. And what works really well in Kitgum doesn't even work in Kampala, much less in Kenya. So the ability to localize and to adapt things, and that's going from northern Uganda to capital of Uganda to the next country over, but right, the ability to adapt things regionally or super regionally is really limited if you, if you aren't open source about your code, which doesn't mean you can't still make money. You can't have businesses that, are, that work well if they're open source, but it means that you have to think a little differently about how you go in. So about three years ago, we started a venture fund in UNICEF. It's the first VC vehicle in the UN. It allows us to do exactly the same thing a venture fund does anywhere in the world. It allows us to find great entrepreneurs in emerging markets and put a little bit of capital into them, often in low liquidity markets like Malawi, where we may be one of the larger capital investors in open source, we're the largest capital investor in open source tech in Malawi. Um, we find good companies, we help them build products that can have these amazing ripple effects and we help them scale them globally. And in fact, the platform that we used in Liberia four or five years ago was the end result of a set of those investments where we bought, accelerated, capitalized a company that was a Rwandan company and they built this open source platform stack, which is now being used by businesses around the world. So I think that adding the financial aspect in as we look at how do we accelerate these, these kind of critical solutions is really important. And, uh, and our venture fund is looking at, at applications of machine learning and AI and using UNICEF's backup, like all of this power of a 12,000 person organization to provide the data sets and the access to government that a lot of these startups need to scale. And that's quite a new model for investing in development because it takes the language of capital which has its own value, and it takes the language of need, and it finds a middle point where you can create global value out of local inspiration. And I think that that's just a, 
uh, a slightly different riff on maybe where we started, where we were trying to do everything ourselves and failing pretty miserably at that. I, I think and two things that jumped out at me there were in terms of context and the need for adaptation. Um, one of the frightening things about Africa is that how arbitrary the borders were. And far be it from an Irish person to criticize cartographers, despite their nationality. I, I do think it's something that people need to think about in terms of consequence. So one of the areas that the ISD Africa Institute is focused on is in terms of strengthening policy capacity, but also in terms of strengthening the research culture in universities and the partner countries you work in. So over the last 10 years, we've helped bring in over 165 million euro of research funding from the European Commission Framework Program to provide the resources to support masters and PhD students who would traditionally have gone to the States or to Sweden. You know, all the Scandinavian countries have been enormously generous to Africa in terms of scholarships, but provide them with an opportunity to work on local societal challenges. And one of the projects um, that we're currently involved in is a project called M Health for Africa. We provided evidence to the European Commission a few years ago to justify the first ever technology call. There were two calls um, focused on African societal challenges. And um, those of you who work with NIH and the National Science Foundation here in the States or the European Commission would know that the research challenges are driven by the funder. In this case, um, these two calls were designed that the African participants would design what the calls should be about to make sure that they were relevant to their environment. So one of the projects um, that was funded under that call is called M Health for Africa, where we're working with ministries of health, district health offices, clinic managers and clinicians in Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi and South Africa to co-design a platform designed to work on a cross-border basis. because illness does not respect a passport or a visa. You know, the fact that you have these challenges, these silos between what happens on one side of our border and what happens on the other side of our border seems asinine to us. So um, over the last three years, we've co-designed that open source platform that's currently being used in resource constrained environments in those, three, in those four countries. And what jumped out at me in terms of what Chris was talking about was that very key importance of having an approach that can be adaptable, the importance of rapid prototyping, you know, working with local partners in those countries, having the Ministry of Health co-design what they need to solve their needs at a policy level, the district health offices, what they need at an implementation level, and then the clinicians and the clinic managers in terms of what they need to do their job. So we need to be thinking about this from a kind of a multidimensional point of view. And I think taking that kind of interdisciplinary approach of bringing together stakeholders with complementary experiences and perspectives is, I think, enormously important. Which brings us nightly on to our second topic, which is how do socioeconomic and sociocultural factors impact on selecting appropriate technology? So can we start with the hand grenade um, who would like to describe what they would regard as appropriate technology? Chris? I've got a different hand grenade. It's about borders, so maybe I'll start with that. Please. Um, not a big fan, personally. Because <laughs> if you look at borders, a lot, who, does anybody go like mountaineering or hiking? No, nobody, there are no politicians and no hikers. Okay. <laughs> well, if you do decide to go in the mountains someday and it's really cold and you're out there and you're lost and about to die, uh, the way to figure out how to survive is you go and find a straight line. Look for a, I'm giving you a tip. I'm saving your life right now in Columbia University. Find a straight line and go towards that because only humans build straight lines. There's no straight line in nature. So if you find a straight thing, go towards it. It's some human-made structure. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, look at a map of any country in the world. You'll find an awful lot of those straight lines. That's because those are not real things. Sorry, political science students. Um, and they're not real because they were drawn by a bunch of white people in Europe a long time ago on a piece of paper. The, I come from, my, my family comes from Poland, what was Poland, what's now Ukraine. Uh, and there are parts of my family on one side, parts of the other, parts in the US, parts in Australia. Um, but the borders that have been drawn on maps certainly don't define people, they don't define how diseases move, and they can't define how we do whatever this financing of innovation stuff that we're talking about is. And I'll give you a, a very specific and concrete example of why that is. Right now, there are about 60 million kids who are on the move because of war and violence. 
60 million kids around the world, and you see a lot of it now because like, suddenly they're in Europe, on the doorstep of Europe. But in fact, the brunt of the refugee crisis is borne by Central Africa and South Asia. And these are countries that have quietly, and, and the countries in the Middle East like Lebanon, for quietly for years and with great humility taken on huge numbers of refugee populations from their neighboring countries and supported these populations to help young people have access to opportunity and choice. But suddenly they're on the doorstep of Europe, look out. Um, the world is unfair. Anyway, we're living in a world with 60 million young people who are on the move because of violence. And UNICEF as a construct was built to deal with sovereign states. That's how, that's how the United Nations, it's the United Nations, right? So we're built to deal with states. And it's very hard for us in a world which is on the move to start to understand how to deal with these populations. Because if it's a state, if it's Kenya, we know how to deal with the Minister of Health, Minister of, I don't know, Education, Minister of whatever. That's what the organization was built to do. But if we need to provide the type of services that Sonia was talking about to a population which doesn't have that interlocutor, we also need to think about how to reframe our own organization our own financing structures, and the type of data that we collect. And this again points to why the proprietary solution, whether it's on the side of data or the IP that we create or how we invest or how we think about those financial flows, is really dangerous. Because if the world keeps going towards this sort of sovereign plus thing that we're all looking at, um, we need to be much more agile and much more adaptable in how we invest in and find problem solvers. Um, because what we certainly know is that the great solutions for the world's biggest problems don't come from New York, Silicon Valley. Geneva. They, don't, they come from places where those problems are best described. But what those well-resourced environments do have, if not the, the solution makers themselves, is the networks that can allow those solution makers to scale. And that's really what we've seen in the investments that our fund has made. So we've got a brilliant drone manufacturer in Kenya. We've got somebody who's doing amazing AI in Cameroon. But they may not have access to the type of networks that we in New York have so close at hand because you can walk out of here and hit a financier. Not physically, but like emotionally, or maybe on the subway, brush up against her or him. And those are things that are at hand in well-connected parts of the world. And so I think that speaks to a slightly different method or methodology when we're looking at how we find solutions and solution makers and how we connect them to the kind of global strata that we can, we can really use to be adaptable in these tumultuous times. So appropriate for you is fit for purpose? I'd say locally created and globally scalable. Okay. And very, very open. So yeah. Yes, I deal with technology, and I deal, my main area, I have two hats, is I advise the projects that are mobile. And yes, it's true, everybody has a phone, if a smartphone almost, and if not, if they don't have one, they have access to one in their house or in the community, and we are taking advantage of that. So, it, you know, probably everybody thinks, so it's very easy, right? You write an app, donate the app, and it's all good. But it's not, so when you're asking about, you know, how do you select the technology to use, there's a lot involved in that. So first of all, people are gonna have phones, but they are not gonna have, actually sometimes even the place to charge the phone every night. So the phone is not always on. Also, you know, they may not have access to data or Wi-Fi for that matter. So which makes things way more complicated. Also here when you're developing, especially, you know, I come from Silicon Valley, when you're developing in Silicon Valley, my students grew up, you know, with technology all the time. So they assume, you know, the cloud is there. In access to the cloud is free or easy. So we learn, you know, that it's not like that. So whenever we are developing for other places, you have to adapt. So this is why we, you know, when I mentioned the Uber style system that we did for, for rural Uganda, that was the idea. We started using, you know, the, what we had and we didn't know much about the specific place we are going and eventually when we finished and donated the code, local, local people, local developers actually, you know, took over and, you know, changed to the services that made sense for them and to the cloud system that was less, you know, less expensive for them. So picking the right technology to use, even if it's all a smartphone, even if it's, you know, Wi-Fi, you have to deal with, you know, different countries are gonna have different services and they're gonna cost different amounts. So maybe you're gonna have to adapt to that. Another example that I had, that I have with that is we did a project for, for an organization that deals with farmers in Africa and help them to communicate information. And the cost for them to send an SMS was super expensive. And you're like, in Silicon Valley, we don't even care about that. People send all kinds of things through SMS all the time. They don't even think about that. That's actually may cost somebody, you know, some money, some more money. And then, we, you know, this person wanted us to compress SMS so that they would spend less money. So, 
as you deal with different countries and different realities, you learn how to pick the right technology to use, how to adapt the technology that we are building to you know, the different realities of different countries and different situations. Sandy? So the cultural, socio-economic and cultural and ethical sensitivity of the kind of work that we do and the technology that we work with is obviously very important. Um, it is, by the way, one of the reasons, not the only reason why in the Millennium Villages project that ended three years ago, we <coughs> deployed it in uh, 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, four in West Africa, six in East Africa because uh, we chose, they were chosen to represent completely different um, agroecological zones. Some were pastoral, some were, uh, you know, uh, some were uh, farming communities. So it was to represent different agroecological zones, but also different sociological, cultural, religious um, communities. And so w that way we learned what are the core things that are true everywhere. Um, you know, such as, you know, some things are immutable regardless of what religion you are. And yet, some things obviously are conditioned by these different um, characteristics of a community. So what worked in eastern Kenya, let's say, did not work in northern Nigeria. So we actually, this question is very interesting to me because we, that's what we were learning is how do you deliver the same actual service but in a different circumstances? Um, I, uh, have also learned, though, that what might be considered culturally inappropriate um, is conditional on what's going on in the in the surroundings. So, for instance, um, when we were doing um, vital statistics, in other words, the CHWs, as they go from house to house, they are supposed to also notify uh, a birth and a death because we're all in the business of trying to get accurate birth and death data for the continent of. Sub for Sub-Saharan Africa and the continent of Africa because it's, it's sorely lacking. And so we had the community health workers, um, uh, of course, uh, note d births and deaths. And that in and of itself is very complicated and sensitive in that um, some mothers don't want to um, admit that it was actually a newborn that died, and so they, the mother might tell you that it's a stillbirth, or they don't want to even tell you that there was a, a death because you, know, you may have to pay for the burial, a culturally um, necessitated burial. And so you know, there are reasons for over-reporting, under-reporting, uh, et cetera. When we started in 2008, to do um, what we call verbal and social autopsies, which were not actual autopsies, <laughs> but they were, it was an application uh, on the smartphone where the community health worker would go to the house of the bereaved family and being trained to be culturally, uh, well, they were locals, but to be sensitive to the situation, they asked a certain list of questions so that we could determine roughly, without a doctor, without a nurse, roughly what that person died of, so that you could at least have broad categories, injury, you know, um, some sort of a, a car accident or malaria, childbirth, a, a newborn death. Um, so the verbal autopsy was a very interesting uh, tool for us because it again allowed, it was another part of the feedback loops that we were trying to learn to do and to have a system so that you would be able to correct, adapt, adjust interventions and implementations in real time. So you learn a lot from what caused the death, not only what caused it, but what was the social autopsy. You know, was it because that the child was sick and the mother didn't have the money to take a, a cab or a car to the clinic? Or was it that she went to the clinic and the clinic was closed for the last three months? Or what, what was the gap in the system? Where was the delay? So it was very informative. But we found that in certain communities, like in Malawi, um, uh, people were not, would not speak to even their local f community health worker because in, in some parts of Malawi, anyway, the, well, there was a lot of superstition and you don't talk about dead relatives. It brings you bad luck. They burn everything of the dead relative, including the health card, clothes, and everything. But once the chief of the village that we were starting the a verbal and social autopsy tool, uh, once the chief explained to the families that this is a way to decrease the chances that the families will lose a child or a mother during delivery, um, it really took a very short amount of time for it to turn around and uh, people actually not only welcoming the community health worker coming in to try to determine what was the cause 
of death, but they actually, we actually came to the point where they were clamoring for it. We only did it for children under five and maternal deaths, and people you know, actually got so used to what they before thought was culturally unacceptable that they said, hey, my 80-year-old grandfather died and nobody came to do a verbal autopsy. You know, what does that mean? So my point being that uh, when you develop these tools, they can be extremely helpful, but if you just dump them, as Chris said, without the acculturation process that takes time, because you have to educate, explain, um, all of us also, you know, if you ask me to switch to something, I will rebel and resent um, unless uh, it's explained and unless I start to understand why it's good for me or good for people around me. So it's like any tool introduction in any setting. I'd like to pick up on this issue of essentially change management that Sonia has picked up, in this case, sociocultural change management. Um, one of the um, design features, call it what you will, uh, that we took with M Health for Africa was that rather than design the data sets around what is currently captured in the big tomes that you have in the clinics, is that we created a meta set. In other words, we would capture all of the unique, all the common elements, but all the unique elements. And then that meant that when we were going and showing the system to someone in Kenya, or in somebody in Ethiopia, or somebody in Malawi or South Africa, they would see fields that they're not familiar with because they're not things that they typically would capture. And one of the interesting things we found was that um, initially it was a bit like, well, you know, this can't be for us because there's something here that we're not familiar with. But when we explained why in Ethiopia they capture a certain type of data. The immediate response from the nurse in Kenya was, that's clever. Yes, we, we would be interested. Don't make it mandatory, but we would be interested in that because that makes sense. And I think this kind of way of building trust, where you respect the sociocultural norms, but you expose people to the context of why, if they buy into it, if they decide to take that decision themselves, by changing the way in which they approach these things, you can end up with a better result for everyone. Um, could we maybe for a moment um, talk about um, ethical concerns? Because you know a number of us have talked about health, but I mean, I think ethics in technology is something that is underestimated in terms of both the sociocultural, but other, the other consequences of introducing innovative ways that may affect the culture in a very, very fundamental way. So who would like to start that football? Chris is smiling. I mean, well, yeah, How can why I resist? Because yeah, there's so much arrogance in a lot of this work that, that we've done. I mean, in my own arrogance and, and, and our teams and the way that we go forward. It's like the biggest fight that I got in in the last five years was with Paul Allen about something that happened during Ebola. You can Google that. I don't feel like getting into it now. Actually, sure. So, um, so Paul wanted to send 10,000 smartphones to Liberia uh, during the height of the Ebola crisis, pre-packaged with a bunch of stuff that he'd built. And it was all very well-meaning. Uh, and f from being in, like you're in Monrovia, and you're sitting there, and you're watching, like, hey, Paul's going to send a bunch of phones. There's a, there's a whole, like the people who were still doing business in October of 2014 in Monrovia who had little shops selling smartphones and repairing them, the last thing they want are Paul Allen's 10,000 smartphones to be dumped for free on the market. Like, absolutely 100% guarantee you the shop owner does not want that, right? Because that's gonna yeah. put him or her out of business. The network operators who are like, most of the people running the networks for the three network operators are most of the engineers had left. Most of them were either from China or Sweden, and as soon as the Ebola outbreak, they've gone. So those networks were like tied together by a, a thread. And the last thing the network operators wanted was 10,000 phones guzzling but the little amount of bandwidth they had left, which was being used to send SMSs. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that seems like a really good idea from one part of this whole spectrum and actually isn't very good if you ask somebody who's an actual human being on the other side of it. And so I think that the ethical considerations in the space of technology and innovation, innovation's like a terrible word because it doesn't mean anything and it means everything and whatever, but if you, so there's a company here that a lot of us have used that rhymes with smoober um, <laughs> that you can use to get a car. Uh, and this company that rhymes with smoober started an experiment recently in, I think it's all documented. So recently in Florida, Uber started to pass off a lot of it, sorry, the government of Florida decided to pass off a lot of its civil services for buses in a few cities to Uber. So you could yeah. take out your phone, if you're living in one of these cities, and you could hail an Uber come and pick you up. You guys heard about this? This was about a year ago. 
Great, so you can get an Uber, you get it for free, it costs the same amount as a bus, the city pays for the rest of it. So city saves a lot of money, because they're not hiring these bus drivers, they ride stupid bus, they're it's very targeted. Uber has a great thing. This is a fantastic innovation. It's crushing it, right? Yeah, technology, making everything more efficient. Unless you don't have a smartphone, in which case your bus ride is just gone. Yeah. Or if you've got a smartphone and the screen's cracked and you're too poor to pay for it. Or if you don't have that data plan. And a lot of technology is designed that way. And I think that there's a real question that we have to wrestle with on information poverty and algorithmic equity in a lot of these pursuits. When we're building big data science models that can help governments make decisions, those models are built on data sets that are sourced from the top two quintiles of people. Maybe you get down to quintile three. But then they become really poor and it's hard to get data from them, so eh, we'll just kind of point a finger there. And that means that data set isn't fair. That's not a good training set. It doesn't create a good model. It means that when you build a platform like for privatizing bus services or something, you suddenly lock out a whole quintile of people or two. And I think that's something that if you're, if you're Facebook, we can, all, we, can, we can talk about Facebook now. Um, if you're Facebook, you've, you're, all of your algorithms are about distributing content to the thickest nodes in your network. Right? That's how you make money. And that's a, there's nothing secret about that. That's how Facebook's algorithms work. It's like, get your Kardashians out to the most other Kardashians, and you're making money. But nowhere in that algorithm is there a question of how do you get a piece of vital information to a girl who's disconnected on the borders of Kitgum Town? because she actually needs that information more than anybody else. And so I think the ethical, uh, well, in the ethical encumbrance upon all of us, the thing that we should be most aware of is that as we're building these tools, and, and we're so privileged to be building them in thickly connected environments, we have to look at that bottom quintile of people economically, their access, and whether or not the algorithms can see them, whether or not the data comes from them, and how we can actually build these systems with them. And that's why, again, that's why our fund is so pointed at investing in companies that are working with people who probably don't show up on a lot of data streams that, that Facebook looks at when it's gearing its, its ads to be as trafficked as possible. Um, so I do think that there's a big ethical question, and I think that the world of, of fast-paced tech development has gotten it totally wrong. I think the language is pretty horrible in, in terms of how a lot of the sort of Silicon Valley verbiage goes. Um, and I think that also the world of development has gotten it pretty wrong in not being able to access some of that speed and agility. And so there is a big middle ground. There's a space of translation that we need to be in um, to make sure that the, the great benefits of technology can reach people who might not be accessed by that kind of language and, and, and economic push uh, in the traditional kind of frameworks that we've been working in. Sylvie? Yeah, I have a little a different perspective on I agree with everything he said. I just have a different perspective on it. It's just that yeah, this is the reason why most of our projects are with somebody in the field who actually asks for something instead of ours going there and saying, you need that, I'm going to build it for you. On the other hand, we do projects abroad, but we also do projects for homeless people in, in the Bay Area. And, and this started... So that's a totally different setting, and that brings up you know, the whole ethics and how to deal with a different population. It's local. Live, they live actually around the corner from us. My university is very close to the airport in San Jose for people who have been in Silicon Valley. And homelessness is becoming a big problem as you know, housing in Silicon Valley is extremely expensive and you know, going up as we speak. So we have a lot of people living on the streets, and it's not like that. Usually you think homeless people, a mentally disabled person pushing a car. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about families living in cars. Kids go to school. Sometimes the person has, he has a job and the mom has a job. They just don't have enough to pay for a house. So we have families living like that. And, you know, our organization in, in San Jose researched and interviewed people and realized that 70% of them have a phone. And they hold on to that phone like crazy because, in, you know, if you have a phone, you are able to talk to your family and friends and, you know, you don't get depressed because depression is a big problem among homeless people. Other, the other important thing, if you don't have a phone, how do you get a job? How do you ha get housing? How do you get out of the streets? So people realize that cellular phones was a super important tool for homeless people. And, you know, Google and other companies donated a thousand phones, and that was a good thing, by the way. So donated a thousand phones for homeless people, and we are part of the group that actually developed applications to go onto these phones that got distributed. And, and interesting enough is 
We, okay, it's the US, it's Silicon Valley, we all live there, but there's a bunch of things we didn't know when we were building these tools for homeless people. First thing is, whenever you complete a form for anything, whenever you register for a service, the first thing that, you know, you ask is the name, right? I mean, it's the obvious question, what's your name? Then what's your address? Homeless people don't have an address. Second, homeless people don't like to give their name. They don't want to be remembered as a homeless person when they are not homeless anymore. And it, so we had to learn how to build these interfaces. So the whole development for homeless people was totally different than what we were used to, or the students are used to, you know, whenever they build a system for anybody, for that matter. So it's a learning experience. And you have to, you know, ethics play, like a, plays a big part here because you have to respect. And you have to build a specific tool that will help them find resources, that will help them find housing, that will help them communicate with each other, find help whenever they need. Because you know, they, they are there, they are at risk, and we have to basically help out, but we have to understand the needs and actually do the right thing. And my mother always said, Paul, there's a reason why you have two of these and one of these. Sonia. Um, I don't I obviously believe that uh, ethical underpinning is critical for everything that you do if you go to any project, especially if you go to somebody else's house or community or country. Uh, it's incumbent upon you to be first and, for, for, first and foremost uh, respectful, courteous, ethical, especially once you start talking about actual recommendation of interventions. And so for me, it's you know uh, obviously no question that that is the highest, first and highest standard. My problem with the ethical component is more on the international uh, scene, which is I think it's unethical that we have tools and institutions and uh, collaborations and internationally agreed on, agreed on partnerships such as the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, Gavi, the Global Fund for Vaccine and Immunization, UNICEF, um, and others, and they're woefully underfunded. Um, and we don't talk about it very much, or we celebrate, you know, when we give X amount of uh, dollars to the Global Fund without saying that that's only 2% of what it really needs. So we celebrate the small increments rather than expose the big gaps. I find that the biggest gap of ethics internationally. So how do we deal with those kind of issues? I mean, if I take, um the environment I work in. I spend most of my time in Africa. Um, you're talking, even if we look at the 18 countries that we work with, what's ethical in one country may not be socially acceptable in another. Um, do people argue that ethics is context specific, you know, based on um, race, religion, geography? Who decides what's ethical? I mean, this is something I'd like us all to think about. Um, maybe as we kind of come to a close, um, I'd like us maybe to talk a little about how can technology and innovation be used to better affect um, in the context of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. So, Sylvia, maybe you'd like to start us off. Well, I, from what I, we have been doing lately, I really believe that you, we can use technology to empower people. So we decided that charity doesn't go a long way, but empowering people goes a long way. So we have been working really hard to always, you know, go meet somebody in the field that, you know, can be empowered, a social enterprise, that's a big movement that actually is making a big impact. Or just a person who would create a business like we did for the solar grid, the microgrid in, in Benning. So empowering, I think using technology to empower people I think it goes a longer way. So I think if you can actually do more of that and, and get people to actually you know, help themselves, that may have like a, a good impact. Chris? Um, last week, the Secretary General came out with his new technology strategy. I would encourage every, I don't usually encourage people to read UN documents, but since I bled, sweated, and cried for seven months helping to work on this one, Please take a look at it. There are five principles in it. There are four that I think answer this question. And there's a lot behind it as well. But it speaks to what the SG sees as the next few years. Um, the first one is the principle of values, having values in building your technology. The second one is around inclusion and transparency. 
and really being inclusive as you build these technologies. Um, the third is around partnerships and building partnerships that, and building on existing mandates and, and, and these kind of groups. But the most important one is the last one. And the Secretary General actually explicitly calls out being humble and humility as his fifth principle in his new technology strategy. And I think that's noteworthy for a variety of reasons. It speaks to the ethical and the global discussions that we've been having. Um, and, and I think it was a really nice signal light that he's put up for all of us who are working in this space. Sonny? I think that's very well said, and I will read it and recommend it to others uh, in reverse order. Um, I uh, would like to be very concrete about um, the technology as I have learned to use it, which is that since I am um, basically live and breathe uh, for universal health coverage, meaning that everybody, that it's a basic human right um, for um, families and all the members um, of any community to have access to basic core health care. Um, I really do appreciate uh, the technologies that uh, sort of frog leap or short circuit um, some of the problems that are experienced in low income settings. So for instance, so of course, as we've discussed, the fact that a community health worker, not a highly trained person who has gone to undergraduate and then medical school and then fellowship, but a secondary degree, secondary school graduate can actually do life saving um, uh, activities at the household level because they can actually consult, consult by telephony, text, um, or algorithm, uh, can consult a um, uh, higher level of knowledge. Um, by the same token, um, it, one of the uh, interventions that we done in the Millennium Villages that has then scaled to the district, region, and then is, has been now nationally deployed is telemedicine. Um, I just wanted to put a plug for um, an intervention uh, that's extremely uh, helpful. Um, it doesn't violate, as a matter of fact, it depends on local culture um, and local mores and local systems. And, but it, all it does is connect uh, the activity and what can happen in the periphery. Um, for instance, what a midwife or a nurse or um, uh, even a community health worker can do uh, at the household by being able to consult um, a, a, a consultant a specialist or a doctor um, in, in a distant hospital. So basically, I really like the fact that um, this relatively simple technologies like a cell phone or telemedicine can bridge the gap places where there aren't enough higher level uh, technicians. Um, by the way, uh, it's not that Africa doesn't educate a lot of nurses and doctors and specialists. It's that they do them so well that they brain drain out and take care of us here in the US. Um, so uh, these technologies really do, can short circuit some of these uh, short term um, supply problems or topographical problems, distance problems, transportation problems. I think one of the problems is it's so easy to fall in love with technology because it's convenient. Um, when I talk to people about the work that Sonia and I are both doing in, in the area of, of health, for example, um, everyone talks about cloud and the importance of cloud. And I say, yes, clouds are very important, but unfor unfortunately, that's water vapor that's not falling where it's needed. Um, so I think we need to think carefully about what assumptions we make you know, if I look at Ethiopia, for example, it's such a large country, there is no local cloud um, available. It is not legal to have data about personal uh, individuals um, not located in Ethiopia. Therefore, by definition, until there is a cloud that is resident in Ethiopia, cloud is water vapor that's passing by. Um, three things I'd like us maybe to think about in conclusion. Um, we have a proponent of the importance of open source principles, and I'm sure he'd be very happy to talk to you afterwards. But from my own perspective, leaving aside the importance of open source principles, I think there are two other things that I'd like us to take away from today. And those are the importance of interoperability and the importance of standards. Because if you have standards, then it makes it easy that irrespective of what hardware, it'll work. Irrespective of whether it's 2G, 4G, 5G, 
whatever G, it'll work. And in terms of interoperability, um, you know, Chris said at the very beginning, you know, part of the whole premise behind the work that they do is to avoid lockout, you know, to don't get locked into a situation where you've got a solution that may no longer be fit for purpose. So we need to think about the importance of these things. I suppose in the end of the day, philosophically, this means that if we want to leverage technology effectively to achieve the SDGs, we need to work in true partnership. And that requires an ethical approach, or at least commonality of ethics. It requires an openness to the transparency issues that Chris also mentioned, and the interoperability issues, and not getting locked into a mindset of, I have a hammer, therefore everything looks like a nail. Um, we are organizing, a couple of colleagues and I are organizing a participatory workshop tomorrow, and um, it's all day, um, that will be looking at these issues of what's appropriate, and how can we work together to solve societal needs, and how can technology play a role. And I hope some of you will be able to join us. In the meantime, I'd like to thank Sylvia, Chris, and Sonia, and I'd like to thank you, Gurav Mila Mahagat, and I hope you'll talk to us soon. Thank you. <laughs>